Uh, well, good morning, everyone. How, how are you? It's a great day in uh, great morning in Chicago, and I hope you can enjoy the rest of the uh, conference. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here because, um, as Tommy was saying, um, I've done lots of jobs in my career, all a lot of fun. One of the best jobs I've ever had is being a small consolation is working farmers in, um, in, um, in the Prairie provinces. And um, I used to be quite involved in this role in World Conservation Society. And coming here reminds me about 20 years ago, I, the last time I was in a meeting like this, I think it was 20 years ago in Baltimore, for the SWCS meetings there in the um, late 80s, uh, early 90s. And uh, I was also quite involved in uh, organizing uh, a conference there. This conference is actually in um, Alberta, in Edmonton. And, um, so I just want to thank people who organize this. This is a lot of work to do. I was quite involved in organizing it. So I know for the local organizers, the people in the Illinois chapter, if you want to put this together, you deserve a lot of thanks for everyone to put this together because it takes a lot of people, a lot of time to think through, not just the logistics of the AI meetings, but the agenda and how they will So thank you all very much. Thank you for reminding me. And one of the things we used to do with in that, uh, which I don't think, I don't know if you still do now, but for some reason when we were organizing our energy conference, we took it on ourselves to um, bake cookies, homemade cookies, for everyone and the, uh, all the participants. So when you have your coffee break, you're not, you're not just sort of typical hotel muffins or biscuits, you get homemade cookies. Now I know that we're still carrying on, but not to put pressure on the folks from, I think next year's in uh, North Carolina, but you may want to think about it, you may want to take a look from all the people here yeah, who want to do that. But, so, how does one go? Like, so now I'm here from that. I'm a uh, consul general. I started as a small conservation. So, well, how, how does that happen? How do you go from something that makes halting ground and works for farmers to sort of going and meeting with wearing suits, meeting with governors and university presidents, all sorts of people? Well, in many ways, the two jobs aren't really that different. Because when you think of it, to be a good soil conservationist, to work in soil conservation, uh, what you're trying to do is make sure you help people. You help people provide the information, the tools they need to make the right informed choices. And that was, that's what the diplomat does as well. It's really helping people, helping people make the right decisions. And that's what the SWCS is all about. Um, <coughs> before I start the, the talk, I'm going to show a short video uh, just now, which really is not so much about water, but it is about Canada and the United States. And I think it provides a nice context about our relationship with Oman. <coughs> Canada and the United States share the longest, straightest, possibly boringest border in the world, but a little closer, and there's plenty of bizarreness to be found. While these situations get along fairly well, they both want to make it really clear whose side of the continent is whose, and they've done this by carving a 20-foot-wide space along the border, all five and a half thousand miles of it. With the exception of the rare New England town that predates national borders or the odd airport that we have expanded, this space is the no-touching zone between the countries, and they're super serious about keeping it clear. It matters not if the no-touching zone runs through hundreds of miles of virtually uninhabited Alaskan Yukon wilderness, those border trees will not stand. Which might make me think this must be the longest, straightest deforested place in the world, but it isn't. Deforested, yes, but straight, not at all. Sure, it looks straight on a map, and the treaties establishing the lines say it's straight, but in the real world, the official border is 900 lines that zigzag from the horizontal by as much as several hundred. How did this happen? Well, imagine you're back in North America in the 1800s. The 49th parallel, one of those horizontal lines you see on the globe, has just been set as the national boundary. And it's your job to make it real. You are handed a compass and a ball of string and told to carefully mark off the next two thirds of the continent. You'll mind that uncharted wilderness in your way and just keep the line straight. Yeah, good luck. With that. The men who surveyed the land did the best they could and built over 900 monuments. They're in about as straight a line as you could expect a pre GPS civilization to make, but it's not the kind of spherical planar intersection that would bring a mathematician joy. Nonetheless, these monuments define the border, and the no touching zone plays connect the dots with them. 
Oh, and while there are about 900 markers along this section of the border, there are about 8,000 in total that define the shape of the nations. Despite this massive project, Canada and the United States still have disputed territory. There's a series of islands in the Atlantic that the United States claims are part of Maine, and Canada claims are part of New Brunswick. Canada, assuming the islands are hers, built a lighthouse on one of them, and the United States, assuming the islands are hers, pretends the lighthouse doesn't exist. <laughs> but let's hope the disagreement gets resolved before someone finds oil under that lighthouse. Even the non-disputed territory has a few notably weird spots, such as this tick of the border upward into Canada. Zoom in and it gets stranger as the border isn't over solid land, but runs through a lake to cut off a bit of Canada before diving back down to the U.S. This spot is home to about 100 Americans and is a perfect example of how border irregularities are born. Back in 1783, when the victorious Americans were negotiating with the British for control over one day in Canada, they needed a map, and this map was the best available at the time. While the East Coast looks pretty good, the Western it goes, the sparser it gets. Under negotiation was the edge of what would one day be Minnesota and Manitoba, but unfortunately that area was hidden underneath an inset on the map, so the Americans and the British were bordering blind. Seriously. They guessed the border should start from the northwestern part of this lake and go on a horizontal line until it crossed the Mississippi. Somewhere. But somewhere turned out to be nowhere, as the mighty Mississippi stopped short of that line, which left the border vague until 35 years later, when a second round of negotiations established the aforementioned 49th parallel. But there was still a problem, as the lake mentioned earlier was both higher and less circular than first thought, putting its northwestern point here, so the existing border had to jump up to meet it, and then drop straight down to the 49th, awkwardly cutting off a bit of Canada before heading west to the remainder of the continent. And it turns out you can't just draw a straight line for hundreds of miles without causing a few more problems. One of which was luckily spotted in advance, Vancouver Island, which the 49th would have sliced through, but both sides agreed that would be dumb, so the border swoops around the island. However, next door to Vancouver Island is Point Roberts, which went unnoticed, and thus today the border blindly cuts across. It's a nice little town home to over a thousand Americans, but has only a primary school, so its older kids have to cross international borders four times a day to go to school in their own state. And the pleasing symmetry of the East Coast has been exact opposite situation with a Canadian island whose only land route is a bridge from the United States. And these two aren't the only places where each country contains a bit of the other. There are several more, easily spotted in satellite photos by the no-touching zone. Regardless of if the land in question is just an uninhabited strip in the middle of a lake in the middle of nowhere, the border between these sister nations must remain clearly marked. Hello, Internet. If you're a super...
to our faith relationship, to our friendship. So environment, water is one of those things we constantly are looking at because water and environment are big parts of our uh, joint relationship. So when we talked about this, um, the, the presentation talk, I mean, we are accessible. It's, we are the world's longest and most open friendly border. 8,800 kilometers or 5,500 miles of border, of which 43% of that, the full 43% of that, or at 2,400 miles, 3,800 kilometers is water. So our border, a majority, a large amount of it is actually over water. So water matters to both countries. And how we manage those waters really does matter to Canada and the United States. That that 43 percent, it includes some of roughly about 300 lakes and rivers that cross our two um, 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 boundaries, and it forms 14 dis uh, distinct sort of transboundary watersheds. If you know. So sharing water and responsibility, and to do it in a way that's sustainable, is of critical importance to two of our border countries. And it, it's so important that. It's, 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 been, it's been a recognition for Canada and the United States for over 100 years. And in one of the first treaties between the two countries, that was over 100 years ago, 115 years ago to be precise, 1909, the Bound um, Water Treaty, that really brought the two countries together to say, how do we manage our waters in a way that's sustainable? How do we manage the quantity of water, the flow of water? How do we want to resolve issues, resolve disputes, and the way that helps both countries? And it became really, 1909, um, the Archive was the first environmental agreement for most of the world. And that agreement from 1909, 150, 105 years later, is still as vital and valid today as it was that in its taken on these dimensions. Um, coming from that, um, the, 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 the treaty was the creation of something called the International Joint Commission. We just called it that International Joint Commission of the IGOC. And it's a, a commission that's sort of um, half Canadian, half in the, uh, the US. That's really the role is to understand the joint waters, those uh, 300 uh, lakes and rivers that gather sort of across the borders, understand some of the issues and how we move forward from them. So, so the IGC has been continuing to wide and active organization that's really well in, in government, in helping local people across Canada and the United States manage the waters that they have joined them. And, and the, coming from that, the, the, the 1909 Balkans Water Treaty really was the recognition that the environment is important to both countries. And since then, and today, there's over uh, 50 federal level agreements between the governments of the United States and some Canada on environmental issues, whether they're water, air quality, habitat, um, a whole range of things. And then over 100 arrangements at different sort of jurisdictional levels between states and provinces, between um, 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 a, a whole range of those kinds of things. Just to give you an example of two of them, um, one is a similar agreement from the sort of uh, 1970s and 80s called the Great Water, as uh, for the Great Lakes Quality, a uh, water quality agreement. It was put in place to clean up the Great Lakes. If you all remember back then, in the 60s and 1970s, about sort of the, 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 the uh, Lake Erie was dying, we were fishing it, and something had to be done. This group was put in place to clean that up. And it was, it was been really quite successful in doing that. It's sort of cleaned up with a lot of the pollution, the polymers, the uh, pollution, and it's really led to um, looking at how do we manage waters. And that agreement that was put in place between two countries also then informed a lot of our, of our own legislation. But it's a key water act in the United States or the Canadian uh, Environmental Protection Act that really looks at how we manage and safeguard our environment for today and also for the future. And as an example, two governments work together to put that in place really quite common. And another example of the greens that exist between our two countries is something called what I use the acting in the one for the and I'm not sure I'll get the uh, acting right, it's the North America uh, Water Power Management Plan. Um, -A -W -N -P. And that was an agreement put in place around the time I started that uh, uh, soil conservation. So it's the 1980, so it's dating myself. And it was really about how do we ensure our water power in the two countries that they, the, that they remain a sustainable and widely population? How do we make sure that the habitat needed for water power in Canada and the United States is always going to be there? That agreement, the one was a great opportunity in that to source conservation. It's a very popular part of Alberta. 
working with partners, working with organizations like Taxi Limited, local communities, local um, um, municipalities, uh, local businesses, equipment dealers, things like that, in putting in place conservation practices. Because in the end, what will make good conservation sense also make good habitat sense or um, water power sense. And that's what the two countries have been doing for a long time, working together on things that sort of really and, uh, and make sense. So, um, so, so the shared waters really are um, critical. That if there's, the, the, the importance of them cannot be overstated. They affect our economy, our future prosperity. They affect our environment. They affect the habitat of uh, the, the wildlife, the waterfowl populations uh, in, in our two countries, and they affect our quality of life as Canadians or Americans. And uh, if you think about the Great Lakes as an example to that, um, <clears throat> some of our great cities. Uh, in the United States of Canada, are uh, in the Great Lakes. Chicago, think of Chicago, think of uh, uh, Toronto, some of our greatest environmental treasures, the Great Lakes themselves, the North Shore of uh, Lake Superior. Our favorite holidays, some of our favorite holiday spots, the Apostle Islands of Wisconsin, or uh, of course, uh, Niagara Ni Ni Falls, or uh, the Thousand Islands, uh, uh, right, right at the mother end of the Great Lakes. Those are part of our fabrics of what we know to be. America and to be a Canada. But at the same time, it's also a huge driver of economy and it's developed one of the most um, impressive manufacturing systems of change there is in the world. So you think about um, iron ore and, and making cars in, in uh, Eastern Canada and in the United States. 90% of all iron ore used um, uh, is shipped through along the Great Lakes from Minnesota, from Duluth, all the way down into the east. Into Steel mills in Canada or in the United States, made into steel, which then goes into making cars in um, Michigan and Ohio and um, the, 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 the US Midwest and in Ontario. That is the system, it's an integrated economy where water and the, the Great Lake really create a sustainable future for us. So, and if you think about that, the, this, this region becomes so wide that you think of that, those states and the, the, and the promises together, if you thought of them as one country, most one country, that that region, the Great Lakes region, would have the fourth largest economy in the world, behind only the United States itself, um, China, and Japan. It is that big, that important, and that is why it's so important that we do manage our um, waters in a way jointly as responsible that Hawaii is put today, but at the same time make sure there's a sustainable future um, for tomorrow. And then that's the, that's the challenge, is how do you kind of maintain that growth and sustainability and as things are keep constantly evolving, the demands of water keep um, growing, uh, things like climate change, changing climates are affecting um, things like water levels, all sorts of things, uh, growing populations, people were expecting more. So how do you do it? <coughs> how do you make sure that we do have all of this, that we have the right information, the right science, like, the right data sets to help us make informed decisions. How do we do that? Um, how do we make sure we have the right engagement, the right involvement from people to make those decisions? Whether they're people in your local um, water um, conservation districts or um, governments and state capitals or premiers and promises making decisions on behalf of their citizens. And then to make sure from that we have the right programs and policies in place to carry that on. I think that is really the challenge for all of us uh, uh, as we look forward into the future. And just to give you another example of that, um, a, a slightly different example, that this is a slide about Lake Winnipeg, which is that great blue one plot on the, on the map in the middle there. Um, lake Winnipeg is the 10th largest freshwater lake in the world, and it drains from the most fertile and productive um, agricultural land there is in the world, all the way from the Rocky Mountains in Western Canada, in um, to the, the Red River, draining the sort of Red River Valley in uh, Minnesota and North Dakota. It provides a huge and productive basis. But there is a challenge. Lake Winnipeg is a eutrophic one. You can see on the right hand side that green, um, the, the lake is green from our alpha alpha blooms. And there's lots of contributors. There's agriculture called point source and non point source, industries, municipalities, all of the watershed. But it's not only eutrophifying. And changes, but it's changes in terms of drainage patterns. They've got the rise of things like um, tile drainage in the United States and Minnesota. Tile drainage wasn't that popular, but there's examples of 
areas with more and more tartar gradients happening, so more and more water is running on faster. And then you're getting changes in climate affecting loads of water, you have too much water or too little water. So the challenge is how do you make sure that we can manage all those cancers? And how do you, how can we make sure that we change the picture from the green on the right hand side to what it should be, which is the blue on the left hand side? That is the challenge it faces. And, and Lake Winnipeg is a, an example of that. The same kind of challenge we face in the United States. We're looking at the Chesapeake Bay, for example, or the Mississippi and the Mississippi Delta. How do you bring those together? Um, how does one encourage that change? Um, the Lake Winnipeg is in Manitoba, and in Manitoba, yeah, Manitoba can do stuff. It's, it's got the jurisdiction, it can put in place policies, programs, legislation to help make changes in that province. But it has no control over other jurisdictions, having no control over taking the snow from North Dakota in the United States, or Saskatchewan or Alberta, we're down in Canada. So, so how do we sort of do that? How, and, and, and so those are the kinds of uh, conversations as we look forward into the future that need to take place. How do we bring all the knowledge that we're trying to collect in a way that's clear? Do we have the right knowledge? Do we have the right science? Do we then must have that? Do we have the right analysis to make that work? How do you then help people make the change? It's very difficult, um, a conversation, a very challenging one. Uh, and then, but that's the, that was the kind of challenges in the United States are going to be facing more and more as you go into the, uh, the future. In Manitoba's example, uh, for example, they're putting in place something called a late friendly court. It's the recognition that they can only do so much by legislation, by enforcement, or, or using their own authorities. A large part of it is the how to convince people to change. So the Lake Friendly Court is an idea to help to have um, people all the way from when you're an individual in your own house to a farmer um, with a hog farm, uh, hog farm in uh, Manitoba to uh, a business that's uh, you know, using water and then putting it back into the, the watershed. <coughs> Having people make their own individual commitments. I commit to do this to clean up the lake. And the commitment has to come with, a, if you like, a hard result. What's the result at the end of that? It's helping people make the change. It's a, it, that's it, the way I look at it. Is how does how can Manitoba how how can Manitoba how can Manitoba work say the community in Minnesota along the Red River, say Moorhead in, uh, in Minnesota, to say, but can you clean up your um, your wastewater treatment, because what you, some of your wastewater treatment might be affecting the quantity of uh, nutrients, phosphates reaching out in the Red River. So how do, how do you bring people to think about situations that um, and, and, and impacts that it may be happening hundreds of miles away from where they are, and, and then put in and not just make the change, because the change means often putting in money in it, making changes when you do this. How do you do that? And if that is really um, uh, the challenge that we face today in looking at our um, issues. So, so now we need to think about water and anchorage. I'm not going to say too much about it because you have a really good, uh, <coughs> um, uh, a, a strong panel to talk about this. Um, a way that I had the pleasure of working with Lake Honey Club um, in the past in my former life in um, and soil conservation um, as head of the um, Canadian Group for the NRCS, um, and then Dr. Howard Rita. Is one of the sort of preeminent scientists in the world around water, water issues, and, uh, and he's written a seminal book. Uh, we chaired a, 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 a chair group of people who put together a report on agriculture and water. I think it was released about a year or two ago. I think I might even help commission that report. But it's a, so if you want to know about water and water quality, water and agriculture and their relationship and what needs to be done, you have to read the um, report that Howard and his colleagues put out. It was done under the Canadian Council of um, Academies, um, or academics or something, um, about two years ago. It really is an influential um, book. We all know about some of the issues with water. Water is critical for agriculture, of course, um, but there's more and more competition for water, and agriculture needs water, clean water, and realizing because it needs for its productivity, but at the same time, um, it does have consequences. You know, it, it sort of uses water, but it can sort of um, pollute the water as well. So pesticides, pieces, nutrients, um, infringement on your heavy areas, and its processes, etc. So how do you tackle that? And when I work in um, the, the Midwest, and I read the newspapers across the um, upper Midwest, so just about every day now, in the Minnesota papers or in um, 
um, um, in Iowa, where you, you'll see articles in newspapers about the water, um, about the water, the lack of water, the loss of habitat, how that's affected groundwater in and agricultural areas in southwest Minnesota, wherever it is. So the, the issue, and those are exactly the same issues that Canadian agriculture is facing today. Um, it's about nutrient management, uh, the quantity too much water, too little water, active depletion, loss of um, habitat, depletion, um, irrigation, depleted water use. Those are the challenges we're facing today. And, um, to, and as we think of today, um, the focus is now primarily is on carbon footprints. How do we make sure our systems that we're using today in agriculture um, minimize the impact in terms of greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions, making us more efficient in agriculture, producing more in that economic but, but reducing the amount of greenhouse gas um, uh, uh, emissions that we do. That is why we call that as continuing. But I would say coming fast behind that is consideration in agriculture, what I call our water footprint. In exactly the same way, how do we make sure that agriculture and the you know, communities around us use water in a way that's efficient to maintain the productivity, but at the same time minimize their impact uh, on uh, water. And that's where uh, everyone comes in. It's not just governments who do this or universities doing the research, but it's the private sector. Just as in the, uh, looking at the supply chain and sustainability, you see companies, whether it's Nestle or Walmart or Coca-Cola, any company, take the lead and plug their own system to <coughs> reduce their impact to make sure that products are more sustainable to use. So yeah, I think we'll see more and more um, private sector also to lead. They're critically important in that because they want to make sure that they're, they're providing good quality products good to people in a way that sort of minimizes the impact and harm on the, uh, the environment. So, so how does uh, one move forward? Uh, and there's many ways to, to do it, and I think one of the key ways is to do it in a way that's innovative, um, that really take, takes innovation as well, but you have to do it in a way that's actually not in survival. Nobody's going to do something, no one's going to mind no farmer will really want to do something, they're going to lose money doing it. You have to make sure you develop tools to make sure you can achieve your, your, your results, but in a way that's economical. That's the challenge. We can do it. We have the um, skills and technologies to do that. Um, it involves engaging people, having conversations, bringing people together to really do that. And, and to really develop the right conditions for change, to make it easy for politicians, policy makers to make change, bring those conversations together. So now this is the home mode. If you think about it, and then this applies to every single one of us in, in our world today, the kind of question, it doesn't matter what scale it is, it could be on the scale of the, the Red River Basin or Lake Winnipeg, or the Great Lakes, or your own uh, watershed district, your soil sort of sort of water conservation district, is how can we bring many projects and efforts together in a coordinated way? You know, to, um, over the last few days, we've been talking about hundreds of projects, hundreds of individual pieces of work. How do you bring those together in a way that's coordinated and effective? Um, and then how do you make sure that we can coordinate this? What's the governance? What's the institutional frameworks we need to do that? And then, um, and then finally, are we really prepared to address these kinds of issues in a way that's integrated um, uh, within a broader set of innovation and economic considerations? In my experience working farmers, you have to be economic to make it a, make, you, you may start off with something you wanted to do something, but you did it in a way that's economic. That becomes a very critical part of that. And I think all of you here, Soil and Water Conservation Society, you're ideally suited to really take the lead part in this conversation. You bring together people from across the world, from Canada, the United States, from all disciplines, whether you're scientists, um, what the universities doing research, or whether you're what the farmers in, in, um, in, in um, conservation districts, or your businesses doing things in sustainable agriculture. You bring all of those skill sets together. Uh, and then you work in communities. You don't just work in big cities like Minneapolis and Chicago. You work in local communities with local people work together. So you, all of you here, really have a key role to sort of play in moving forward on that. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I'd just like to end with the project we started uh, with the, the, the Ron Rain said uh, quite a few years ago now. Let the, uh, she said 5,000 miles ago that we let it go 500 miles. Uh, between Canada and the United States stand as a symbol for the future. Let, let it not be a point of division, but a meeting place between our great and our friends. So thank you so much, thank you for the time, and we great to look forward to the conversation.
speak about a, uh, a friend of the society and a leader in conservation and environmental management. Uh, Andy Morali has recently retired from the US EPA, where he served as program analyst, bear with me here, in the Office of Planning, Policy, Analysis, and Communications. That would be a heck of a business card. Uh, earlier in his career, he served as Senior Policy Analyst at the Wallace Center for Agricultural and Environmental Policy at Windrock International. His research interests include agricultural and environmental policy, greenhouse gas mitigation, and weather policy. And he previously served as Chair of the SWCS Science and Policy Committee and during that time, uh, the Society's Climate Task Force prepared the report, Conservation Practices to Mitigate and Adapt to Climate Change. So with that, Andy, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I have an easy job. I, I actually just moderate this wonderful brief. It's this wonderful brief. Make sure it's on track. And one of my jobs is to make sure that everyone understands what the game rules are. So one of the things I like to do, I'm going to have the, the three, really four panels, as I hope the judge stays with us up here to uh, actually uh, answer the questions. Um, we'll have a, a small uh, introduction. Uh, each person who's going to be on the panel, this wonderful set of people, is probably going to have a few minutes to actually submit a couple of slides if they want to. Uh, and then uh, I will uh, introduce the, the first question that not everyone has to answer. We'll try to answer that for three or four minutes. It's going to build upon the uh, introduction uh, by Jeff uh, 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 Shenzhen, who gave us a very good overview of the challenges and a lot of the, the how are we going to actually address this, uh, the, the joint management of these uh, resources that we share between the two countries. Hopefully this panel gets a lot very very much into the details of what we are actually doing and how well we're actually doing. So rather than me talking very much more, we now introduce our first panelist who come up uh, and give a short short uh, presentation and then sit down and uh, then I'll introduce the next. And the first one is of course uh, is uh, Howard Peter, who is the uh, uh, director of the Global Institute for Water Quality and that introduction. Um, so I'm a new Canadian. I've just clocked up four years in the prairies. Um, and uh, um, I've come in to lead a program in water security and force water quality and water quantity are intimately linked and we have a set of major issues this country. Uh, so eloquently explain. It, it's almost difficult following Jan show. Um, so I have no idea what he's going to say. Um, and it's also a very difficult act to follow. But uh, I have a few slides put together which I think will pick up on some of the key themes um, that he mentioned. Um, he, I thought he mentioned Lake Winnipeg, and certainly in Western Canada, Lake Winnipeg is uh, one of the most uh, um, significant challenges that we have in the city. So it's a huge lake, kind of largest in the world. 2007, it had an old boom in the city. Um, but the nutrients are um, an issue that, across a wide range of scales, and they really challenge our science as well as our policy. Um, we, we have multiple sources, as Jan had mentioned, we have multiple actors, um, and how do we coordinate um, those multiple individuals to address the problems? We, we see impacts on local and, and regional water resources, we, we perhaps tend to think a lot about surface water, but groundwater is a major issue too, and that little uh, diagram at the bottom shows some of the issues in nitrates in groundwater in Ontario, um, as over the decades they exceed drinking water standards. Um, and the impacts are very diverse, so clearly the impacts on heating systems are important, um, but where the rubber hits the road, there are major issues, certainly in Western Canada, about drinking water treatment. Given the high organic loads associated with um, nutrient rich systems, uh, amenity is a major issue. Um, so many people use lakes for recreation. Um, and then human and animal health. Um, and uh, I was speaking to um, a colleague.
Ronnie, uh, a couple of years ago, he was coming in, he took a dog for a walk in prairies in Alberta, he got away from him, uh, moved to the under a fence and dug from, uh, drank from the dog out, and um, a few hours later he was dead. So, Doxy, Alvin Blooms, um, and has severe impacts on uh, this was, uh, and people. Um, these challenges run across multiple scales and they raise some very difficult issues for us. So even at the local scale, we're talking about um, perhaps competition between sectors for uh, uh, use of water and preservation of water quality. But then clearly it gets more complicated as you move across jurisdictional boundaries. And uh, that's what Jan Chen was referring to uh, in US Canada. But um, this of course occurs internationally. And just a few years ago, I was involved in a court case between Argentina and Uruguay, um, which came to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, and that was all about nutrients in the river Uruguay, um, and um, just joint responsibilities for, for managing um, uh, nutrient discoveries. Um, so these nutrient issues are, uh, I think, really challenging, and some of the cost estimates are pretty scary. Um, so as the USA report um, 2011, Regarding those of Chesapeake Bay, which talks about 1.7 billion, billion dollars worth of damage. Europeans put together, probably many of you have seen this, the European National Assessment just a few years ago, um, and they came up again with some very high costs. But if you look closely there, um, you'll see an enormous range of costs, which sort of is indicative of how uncertain we are about the, um, uh, the impacts of nutrients and the nutrient management problems. So, I work at a university, and I'm just going to say a few words um, to talk about some of those challenges, because as Jan Trichet said, <laughs> um, what we need is basically sound science and appropriate science to inform policy, and it's very difficult to see policy moving forward unless we have a clear understanding of the issues. Um, so first of all, we've got the challenge of defining our problems, um, and that can arise at local scales, but more well, particularly, I think the challenges we have are in our bigger basins. Uh, we've got a very complex uh, set of actors in this um, diffuse pollution um, problem, and, and how do we actually quantify uh, the roles of those actors and their responsibilities? And then we really need to understand um, how we can manage the environment to help mitigate adverse effects. And of course, there are obvious Targets such as end of pipe polluters um, and urban discharges and so on, but much more difficult really is the agricultural sector. And there we have the issues of beneficial management practices, um, which of course a huge amount of work has been going on in this area for at least uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, but how far has it taken us? So I think not far enough to really answer some of these challenging problems. I don't think we can answer the question as to what are the impacts of the set of beneficial management practices at large basis scale. Um, uh, partly because we're unsure about the complexities of the effectiveness across different environments, and partly because we're unsure about how the environment will respond to management changes. But really without that scientific underpinning, um, then we can't uh, follow those next steps which would take us into uh, risk assessment, cost benefit analysis, the development of policy instruments. So I think we have a real challenge and our science is not yet up to task um, in helping policy uh, as it might. So my view of the current situation is, well, we've made some significant progress in terms of looking at issues at base and scale in terms of loadings. And Jamshed talked about the International Joint Commission. It's been doing a lot of work on the Red River, and one of its focal points has been the Sparrow model. Um, so it's a rather crude model, it's effectively a steady state model, but it gives us a first order assessment of the sources. And importantly, it really builds on the strengths of the available observational data, so it's an empirical assessment, um, untainted by um, speculation about what model, model parameters you might need to apply. So I think we're making progress, although it's only first order progress at that base and scale. Um, when we come to BNPs, then a lot of work has been done on different in different environments, and we all know how complex these issues can be. We can have BNPs which are beneficial in one environment and one application, and have the opposite effect in another. Um, 
I think we've done it sufficient to monitor and understand them. All around the world, I was most of my career in the UK, we spent a lot of money in the UK looking at BMPs without putting, recognizing the long time scales we need to understand the impacts and the intensity of monitoring that we need to um, uh, pull together a clear understanding of the causes and effects. So I think we're really lacking in the strategic application of that knowledge to look at the basin scale impacts. And there are many reasons for that that we can get to in the final discussion. So just a, a couple of closing slides to show you my um, home playground. So we already had um, an indication from Jack Shed of the uh, late uh, Winnipeg uh, catchment, and this is the western uh, uh, contributing area. It's about 340,000 square kilometers off the side of France, and um, it's a major um, source of nutrients. And a major source of challenges um, in terms of uh, uh, land and water management some of you will be aware at the moment um, of some of the discussions going on across the Saskatchewan Manitoba border because we've had records on a rainfall that's given very, very unusual sun flooding in environments which normally just have spring snowmelt. And so uh, Manitoba is currently pointing the finger at drainage in Saskatchewan. But I'm going to focus on the nutrients, and, and this is the nutrient story in the upper uh, part of the basin. So we've got the Rocky Mountains here with fairly pristine water and we move down the tributaries in the South Saskatchewan through the heartlands of Alberta and its agricultural um, activities. And the, the blue line shows total phosphorus and Alberta until recently had a guideline for TP of 0.05 milligrams per litre. And as we come through tributaries like the red here, we can see um, really how severe the concentrations are in comparison with that guideline. So Alberta is having difficulties with its gully line, that's probably going to throw it away. Um, we in Saskatchewan, of course, downstream. And um, uh, one of the interesting features about transboundary waters is, of course, they also apply to provinces in Canada, the states in the US. There is no total phosphorus concentration agreed at the Saskatchewan Alberta border, but there is one agreed at the Saskatchewan Manitoba border, which is an interesting point. Um, the saviour in all this, in terms of downstream loads, is Lake Diefenbaker. It's a very big reservoir, 225 kilometres long. Where's all the phosphorus going? Obviously, in the bottom of Lake Diefenbaker, which may be good for Manitoba, but it's not particularly good for Lake Diefenbaker. Um, okay, so um, we're, we're just starting in Western Canada to put together the information we need to manage this problem. So, this is the first strategic assessment being made of the contributions. Phosphorus loading in these basins using the Spiro technique from USGS. Um, but we still have a big job to do to uh, understand the effectiveness of the MPs and how we can use that to mitigate the, uh, to mitigate the problem. And just to close, then, Jan Chan gave a plug for this report. This is it. Um, so, maybe that's the Academy's um, uh, commission this report to look at the interaction between agriculture and water in Canada. Um, uh, one of our major recommendations was the importance of improved science to underpin assessments of beneficial management practices for nutrients. Unfortunately, by the time the report was published, Jan Shan had moved away, and um, it seems that the main response from the Canadian government was actually to shut down the Webb's project. Uh, which is the core program of ASC supporting work on BMPs. So anyway, um, this is uh, freely available and downloadable on the web if you're interested. So thanks, just a few things. opening remarks for this session.
<laughs> you talked about how it's all about helping people. I kept waiting for a reference to show in my ear. <laughs> so I realize you're much more gentlemanly than I am. Uh, when I started thinking about this particular uh, focus for this uh, symposium this morning, this session this morning, you know, I, to me, I started just thinking about some of the commonalities, uh, some of the common issues that, that we're facing, regardless of which side of the and some of the more pressing issues is one of this population change. Because that means we've got to grow our food. You know, we, we can't be dependent upon other parts of the world, other countries, these things, uh, for our source of food. And, and so I think what I often do not hear recognize is that, yeah, we may be able to cheat types of crops, we may be able to increase our yields that way, grow more food that way. But what is not often recognized or often stated is if your plants are producing more, they're consuming more water. That's just plant physiology 101. I mean, those plants transpire. So that is, I think, an immediate recognition that we all need to have. And that's the commonality that we have uh, across the grounds of which side of the border. Another, particularly in the U.S., we are having major issues uh, with productions of land use available. Uh, between uh, 1982 and 2007, we lost over 41 million acres of rural land uh, to, to uh, develop. That's like losing the size of Illinois and New Jersey combined in the US. And so we not only have to grow with all this additional food for this growing population that's supposed to expand from just over 7 billion people now to over 9 billion people by the year 2050. We not only have to grow all that food for those additional people, but we have to do it on shrinking and available land mix. We also have, um, we're also experiencing these extreme weather events, regardless of what's on the border. I mean, it's really shown up a lot with flooding, more than flooding, and forever river basin, um, but, but just things like track. So it happens in both extremes. And so that's another you know, common area. Um, and so what that tells us is that we need we work on increasing resiliency of our food production systems um, to prevent these climate events. Uh, there's also an increased need for us to become more dependent, or independent, I should say, reduce our dependency on foreign sources of oil. And so, uh, to the extent that we can grow our own energy, we also have that commonality. Um, with the kind of the face of climate change, we are also expecting complexity of our pest disease pressures. Uh, just, just changing the temperature uh, by one or two degrees centigrade can have a dramatic impact on the depth of freezing in the soil and therefore the survival of insects and uh, plant pathogens, soil-borne plant pathogens. Um, it's, it's not just uh, how cold it gets, but it's also the rate of freezing and the rate of thawing that also influences those types of things. Um, so we're, we're going to experience those types of, uh, of uh, additional pressures uh, just from related to climate change. Um, one of the things that will probably come up in some of our conversation that I think is also common uh, to us is that, you know, I'm all about increased innovation. There are so many things, new, new products, new services that are coming about all the time that really have a lot of promise, but there's also some things that are tried and true that have been around a while, but we're just not getting the adoption. And so a real common problem that I'm seeing there, what I think can really help that, and really help that whole outreach to get more of the adoption of those tried and true practices is economics information. And not just on um, the potential profitability for these types of practices, but the, to the extent that they can reduce risk. Farmers are generally risk averse, and I don't like them. Uh, I, I would be too happy to depend on the weather, the vagaries uh, of the weather. But um, to the extent that we can quantify the risk uh, reduction attributes of some of these conservation practices, and, and to me it just makes sense that it should, that should be translated into reduced loan interest rates, uh, reduced uh, crop insurance premiums, hopefully. I don't work with insurance 
companies, so I can't speak for them. But to me, it just makes sense that we should be able to essentially use those types of uh, processes and information to drive more conservation, to help with water quality, to help with water conservation. Uh, that will help us deal with a number of these issues, regardless of the size of the boundary we're on. So I just would offer those up as uh, some uh, introductory thoughts and comments uh, for pondering, and I'm sure will come up uh, in some of our discussion later on. Now the next speaker, our next panelist, is uh, Alex Beckles from the San County Foundation and the Justice Department. I also remind people that the actual problem, I will link the uh, extensive biography and description of our panelists, uh, is present uh, in uh, the packet that you have. So therefore, I'm not going to go into the detail. I can't You can hear back there? I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Alex. Uh, good morning. Uh, as uh, Andy noted, I'm a consultant, so that means that uh, I get on the airplane a lot. I go to a lot of meetings. One of the things I always do when I go on the airplane is look around for the fuel truck. One of the things I always do when I go to meetings is make sure I've got fuel. I'm really nervous this morning. When I saw there was a fuel truck out here to uh, get us through this meeting, but I see about half of you did on your own, so I think we're fueled up enough to talk about some of these uh, 21st century uh, environmental challenges. Um, what I want to talk about, um, Andy gave us a series of questions and asked us to talk with three slides. Uh, he gave us about five questions, so I'm going to start talking about one of those questions uh, on my three slides, and so we'll get to the rest of them in the uh, further discussion. And the first question Andy asked is, are we doing enough to meet the 21st century environmental challenges? <laughs> So my answer is emphatic no, and I'm going to talk a few minutes about why. Um, you know, the, we all get probably the most candid advice in our lives from our family. Uh, you know, they're the ones that look at us and go, really? Is that what you really want to do? Uh, and one of the things my wife will tell me every now and then, and uh, uh, I have to be reminded of it too often, is uh, one of the definitions of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. Uh, and, and I think that's something we've got to ask ourselves. Um, we're not innovating fast enough. We're not doing enough new things. We're not taking a new look at how to solve problems uh, nearly enough. Uh, I was thrilled that Wayne talked about the engagement of economics and decision making to support better conservation options. Uh, I was thrilled that uh, Howard talked about advancing science. And, you know, a lot of what we do in conservation is sort of, yeah, it has this kind of effect in you know, the sort of direction of the assessment of uh, what the conservation outcomes are. Uh, that's not what farmers do. Farmers have extraordinary sharp pencils. They know where the inputs are needed. They know what the costs are. They know how to ask the question, how do I maximize my return on investment? We're failing to do that in the conservation community, and we've got to take that on. In the next generation, we're going to see a massive intensification of agriculture like we've never seen before. And if we don't see a massive intensification of conservation and focus on how do we maximize the return on investment of conservation outcomes, we're going to be in far worse shape. And so I hope that that's something that this community can help lead. So yesterday, I talked extensively about nitrogen management and how we can provide some uh, innovation in that. Uh, I'm going to talk about the stacking of uh, ecosystem service benefits. If I can have the first slide, please. So I'm not going to talk about nitrogen in this year. I'm going to talk about flooding. Uh, and when I found that we were talking about uh, U.S. transport uh, issues with Canada, uh, I was drawn to this part of the country to take You know, I love the USGS. They try to make things not inflammatory. Uh, and so instead of using red dots for problems, they use red dots for things that are not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these dots that you normally think of as sort of more quiet, uh, those are the ones that say, look out, look out, our hair's on fire. Uh, this is a great illustration. Our hair's on fire here. And, um, you know, to some extent, we don't care because the problems go into Canada. Uh, 
but you know, maybe we ought to care about that and, and the problems manifest themselves here as well. Uh, so this is just one illustration of a problem. We've got a transboundary problem that's generated in large part by practices that are occurring uh, with our borders and are manifesting themselves in Canada, and we need to figure out what to do about it. Uh, this, uh, uh, I want to commend uh, WRI for putting this map together. Please put a new one together. You may have already done it. I just haven't found it. Uh, uh, so in this part of the world, this is a map of where we have intensive trial of training. Uh, I bet that map covers about half of what it should cover today. We have a massive expanse in the uh, trial training. Very good reasons for that. Uh, it's the guy who wrote Swamp Buster, you know, uh, when people would talk about training, I used to sort of make my head spin around like a little girl on the exercise. Uh, but there's some good things that come from trial line training. So this is not weapons trainers, this is stuff we can all work out and agree is a prime piece of ag plan. And typically you might see a 30% increase in ag productivity if they're tile drained within these black, very black uh, soils. Uh, you also typically see less phosphorus loss, but we just built a super highway to move nitrogen off the field. Um, and there's something we can do about that. We can install uh, a management structure. Um, and uh, a full set of uh, slides are available on this uh, from the presentation that yesterday I presented posted on the website, uh, so those will be available. Uh, this is the river. This is the flooding associated with this massive runoff. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that we don't just think about a single ecosystem service like water quality, we think about multiple ecosystem services. Uh, the farm can manage their tile lines to reduce that kind of they can engage in commerce. Uh, you know, I don't know how much a pound of nitrogen is worth to keeping it out of the Great River. I do know how much each one of those cars is worth in keeping water out of them. We now have the technology that we don't have to just implement this field by field by field by field, but this emerging technology called swarm technology is being developed by the system services exchange, by the Nature Conservancy, by Agritrade, uh, by a couple of high tech companies, where we can manage trade control structures not on just the individual farm bases, but on the entire worship. And we can link and manage thousands of these different systems together. So, ultimately, the point I want to get to is we've got to get these and this properly aligned. Farms get paid for producing corn, beans, apples, cattle, pigs, chickens. We need to add another commodity, another set of products to their bottom line, and we need to be able to associate environment performance with improved farm economic viability. Until we get those economics line, we're not going to achieve what we need to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Actually, come up here because you're going to hear me a whole lot better than what I'm talking about there. Now, I'm inviting. Please join us uh, on the uh, podium, and we'll begin. Also, remind people that I'm going to be asking a few questions first of our panelists, uh, five questions. But there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions, and that's why you actually have a uh, little piece of paper on your tables. What I'm requesting that you do is to ask the, uh, if you're inspired and we have you, you uh, you can see your question, please raise your hand with the question. And one of the people from SWCS will, will come to your table and take it and bring it up to me so I can ask the panelists. That's the way we can see. So let me begin. Hopefully we, we, we've uh, begun to address the first question that I posed to the panelists. And that has to do with, are we making progress in restoring our, our shared food resources? Uh, I hope the, the panelists will also respond to what other people have, the other, their fellow panelists have said. Oh, do you need to go first? Okay. Anyone can start. Um, so, um, are we making progress? We are, but as um, Alec was saying, there's a long way to go, and the, 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 um, the answers are constantly shifting and moving. As climates are changing, the weather patterns are changing, it's really changing. As agriculture is intensifying, as and, and, and policies change, everything is constantly moving. So, we always need to be much more nimble, much more. Um, to them. 
and it's becoming more and more uh, difficult in terms of the governance. It's not just about farmers or farmers anymore. It's about us as society, as the consumers, and our needs and wants as well as consumers. And that's also driving a lot more changes. So you've got a whole, and then you have things like social media, a whole part of ways of um, making a prime link for the conversations into things. Um, lots of people with opinions, you may be right, may be wrong, may be totally not involved, all of those things. So the management of that becomes much more difficult and challenging as we move forward. And, and nothing can stay the same. So we still have to keep looking for examples of, uh, like, it's interesting that three of us use that same kind of an example. So, and North Dakota is amazing, right? You think that's kind of a fairly dry place, but then that might not be that. They've had flooding back almost like three or four years uh, in a row, right? And all of a sudden, but it's they've all been ready for a spring run, uh, I mean a snow melt run. What they're getting is um, intense storms in Saskatchewan and or in, in Canada coming down. Things that we're not yet designed for. Um, the, the other big issues are going to be as water becomes more and more precious commodities are demand, not just in agriculture, but in terms of society, wants more and more water. The challenge is going to be where you're getting from, whether it's groundwater or surface water. So things like the trans um, bound and move the water, trans basin moving the water from one watershed to another will become more and more critical kinds of things. For Canada, watching things like move from potentially moving water from the Great Lakes basin into other uh, watersheds or from move water from the Missouri, for example, into the Red River, those are things to watch. So you've seen in the past the unintended consequences of those kinds of things. You know, we move it for our quantity, but quality suffers, the major species, and quality whole plants. Those are the kinds of things that they get in anyway. So just now, I would say water is, is, a, is going to be a critical issue for managing in between the two countries in the future, but also within the two countries, uh, um, the, the policies and the practices around water management. Okay. I, I agree. I think there are several areas notable progress. Uh, five years ago, uh, we need to talk about targeting of uh, conservation investments and probably would have gotten to find one. Uh, that's now mainstream, and that's a major difference. Uh, we've got folks like uh, Wood Rock and Sand County and WRI collaborating on uh, performance-based investment strategies. That's a major advantage when we're starting to say, what are we getting for conservation what we need to do more of is diversify the number of metrics that we look at. Uh, water is uh, something that's critical, not just for nutrient issues, uh, but flooding issues for biodiversity. How do we stack those multiple variables in the team? And how do we align the incentives to encourage the kind of outcomes that we want? Uh, and until we can develop more refined tools, uh, we're going to come short. Uh, so, for example, one of the phrases that I will never use. BMP may stand for bullshit data in practice because we can never quantify what the outcomes are. And I think we've got to do that. And you know, I recognize the variability of agriculture. One practice that works well in one place is not going to work nearly as well in another place. But we need to understand what those outcomes are. And the scientists have asked me up that we need to do that now. Not a tough that. I think it is incumbent upon us to recognize the advances that have been made. Uh, I think the Conservation Effects Assessment Project, referred to as CEEP, has shown that in the Great Lakes area we've been able to reduce sediment loss and nitrogen through the surface pathways um, through runoff and phosphorus loss by 40-45% each. Um, it also shows that we're not doing as well with the leaching losses. Nitrates have been harder enough to crack. An anion it's repelled by the negatively charged soil, and you know, it's even more leaching. But, but even in the Great Lakes, we have been able to reduce nitrate losses by about 30 percent through their conservation investments. So, I think it is important to recognize those benefits, but also equally important to recognize that more needs to be done. Uh, that same particular um, study, uh, the seep efforts and modeling efforts, have showed us that there's almost 8 million acres in the Great Lakes area. That is still in modern to high need of additional conservation measures or treatments, I should say. And uh, so, if we could get those on the ground, things like no till, cover crops, you know, th those types of practices, and I mean, accompanying that and the nutrient management that 
goes along with those changes uh, because there is no single BMP because it is a system, so these are conservation management systems, um, then, uh, then we can achieve some of these additional goals. Um, I do think there's some uh, opportunities there that are relatively fresh that we are launching on. Uh, one is our soil health campaign. Uh, it's not just about USDA, not just about NRCS. It's, it's, a, it's a actually becoming a worldwide uh, campaign and initiative. In uh, many respects, it's about building carbon in the soil and therefore available water like capacity in the soil, uh, therefore resilience of our systems, and therefore you know, we help also improve water quality and, and increase carbon sequestration, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, all these uh, attributes later habitat, all these things, you know, that are important for us to also be able to grow our food in an environmentally responsible manner. And so that's one, I think, real opportunity. Another one that was just announced this year, the USDA is the Resource Conservation Partnership Program. And that is something that I think just has a whole lot of potential. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not highly structured. It's very, pretty much up to the partners to design uh, the partnership and address the resource issues the, the way that you see they need to address it. And uh, so there's a whole, uh, the door's wide open for creativity, for identifying those resource issues. And so I think that is uh, another, I think one of the tools that is now in our toolbox as of this year uh, that will can help us uh, make some traditional changes. Okay, um, I think I agree with everything that everybody said, but I'll make a couple of Additional observations. The first thing is to note that the um, US Academy of Engineering uh, looked at the challenges that society was facing in the 21st century. They came up with 10 random challenges, things like uh, nuclear fusion. Um, and one of those 10 random challenges is nutrient management. Uh, so it's out there, it's one of the really big issues. And um, while I think we are making progress in various directions, I don't think we're making sufficient progress recognizing. Um, the magnitude of the problems that we have, um, both at local level and at regional level. And those um, images that Jamshed showed, the lake in Tego, should be a start to wake up call, I think. Good things are happening on the ground, um, that's for sure. Um, I think over the last decade or more, there's been a real emergence of local groups who care about their watersheds, uh, and that brings, they bring together local communities, I think also we started off uh, by having perhaps a naive 
leaders talk in the manufacturing. And, and now people recognize we've got a complex issue, we've got sources of, of nutrients, we've got pathways, we've got receptors. And to actually monitor those requires a lot of resource. Um, we can't just expect uh, a few measurements from the stream and then bank out what the, what's been going on upstream and what's worked and what hasn't. So we need a lot more investment in detailed monitoring. And that's starting to take place, um, but it's been a long learning curve. And then I think we're really bad at putting our models and our data together. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that use um, uh, standard models and they apply them and they get a result. Um, and I don't think we should believe those results because the models are not tested enough against data at multiple scales, at the fine scale as well as the large scale. So we need to get better and more critical developing our models to allow us to generalize our understanding. I guess I'd like to chime in here though too, it's relate very much to what you just described uh, with our edge of field monitoring. This is something that NRCS has really jumped into with both feet uh, the last couple of years. If we, we played around with it about three or four years ago, we recognized there were some improvements that need to be made and now uh, we've uh, worked through an interagency panel group that's really refined uh, the scientific rigor, rigor for our edge uh, field monitoring is practice activities. And um, this is something that I think has a whole lot of potential because there are those uh, that look at the stream and say, well, if the conservation practices are working, then why is the stream water quality not improving? Uh, they're not making that connection. And there are those legacy effects, there are those lag times, uh, there are those issues of all the other land uses going on within the watershed that affect that stream water quality. And so, again, to the extent that we can quantify the benefits of those conservation practices right at the edge of the field where he or she, the farmer, has control, um, then that should help us communicate the benefits of those practices and give people that longer-term vision that continued investment in those conservation will have that pay payout uh, for that stream water quality and also can help drive more adoption. I think we're making significant progress on several areas of science, particularly some of the natural science issues of assessing what the outcomes can be from implementing practices. But we have huge gaps. We don't look at the social science hard at all. Uh, we don't ask the question, uh, what's the environmental return on investment? Uh, I think we're fortunate that we're really doing, you know, we're not there yet, we've got lots of challenges, but you know, whether it's the millennium assessment, Assessment or the issue field assessment, we're getting much better science on outcomes, but we're not building decision support systems that say how do we take a limited set of funding and human resources to invest in conservation to make those investments into sets of practices and systems in the right places that's doing the most good. We need to build that decision support system. We need to start adding economics as a critical part of the science. Just following up on what uh, Adam was saying, um, science is critical, but just as critical to do this when you think about the watershed or region, you have to bring the local people, the local communities along with you. So in your conversations about science, you have to, as you're evolving that, as you're getting the information, you know, you, it's critical that we involve local people. And an example of that, for example, is actually part of the, the, the video, right? The Lake of Woods in the Northwest Angle area, Lake of Woods Rainy um, uh, River Rainy Lake uh, uh, watershed that eventually goes up into uh, Hudson's Bay. It's a kind of a US piece. A lot of people, a lot of interest there. So they're looking at the management plan for that. So the, 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 the folks that are working together, the scientists doing some of the data gathering to understand the dynamics of that system, whether from a quantity or quality point of view. But really involved in every step of the way the local communities, whether it's a, 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 the, the municipality, the farmers, business owners, cottage owners, in that. So people are aware as that goes on. Because you're getting to the point where you just can't do things in isolation. People have to be brought in, they have to agree on things, putting it together. It's small work, but it's, the payoff is way better at the end of it. Because you do have then an agreement to move forward on an action plan. That does make sense to keep on board with that. We only have a time for uh, one question uh, from the audience. A number of the questions that have been brought to me all relate to the impact are very interesting. But anyway, are we actually?
actually doing enough economic analysis with regard to coming up with solutions to the problems of these cross-border uh, issues. Uh, again, I address that. Uh, what can we do, for example, one of the ideas that we've discussed a whole lot is in terms of uh, markets. Are we collecting information or can we need markets in order to leverage, better leverage public funding and bring more private dollars to address these issues? Back in 1985, we wrote the first conservation side of the farm bill. Uh, the, the world was really different. Uh, corn was trading at a couple of bucks a bushel if you were lucky. Uh, the federal government was doing a massive subsidy of uh, uh, lots of different commodities. Uh, you know, there were the white commodities, the cotton, milk, et cetera, the, the uh, traditional commodities you think about in this part of the world. And the contribution title actually saved the taxpayers and the federal government millions of dollars. And it was a huge resource that we were able to bring in to invest in conservation outcomes. That universe is upside down now. Uh, the conservation title is not a net saver to the federal budget. And we all got very comfortable with relying on that set of income to invest in uh, as a principal source of contribution investment. Uh, I, I don't want to turn my back on that, but it's not enough, and there's not going to be more than that source. And we've got to figure out the new funding mechanisms. And I think figuring out how to develop ecosystem service markets at multiple scales could be critical to that. And buying some ecosystem services, whether it's a wastewater municipality that could uh, buy water quality or cheaply that they can build a wastewater plant, Coca-Cola that's just offset its uh, environmental footprint, uh, or other buyers, and there are plenty of them out there, they need assurances that what they pay for is what they're going to get. And we've got to have that kind of set of numbers with us. And I, I think, Andy, you know, specifically, the role of the government, one of the things it needs to help us do is develop that kind of transition. And I know we are spending a lot of time thinking about how to develop ecosystem service markets. Uh, the NRCS in the long term is not going to be the buyers of those, uh, but I think that's one of the critical things that we can take on in the short term is how do we develop the systems to transfer to an additional major investment source coming out of the ecosystem service market. Uh, I, I can say a couple of things. Um, clearly, in terms of uh, on farm activities, there are some. Uh, some win win. So, uh, uh, fertilizers are expensive, and it's in nobody's interest to overuse. And there's really interesting developments in smart technology for applications of both fertilizers and pesticides um, that are going to lead to more efficient uh, use in, in the landscape. Um, so, that's for sure. Um, however, I think um, you know, it's a much broader role um, with a wide range. And we've also talked about uh, linkage between um, funding issues and kind of health issues and water quality. And, and all these issues hinge around um, ideas of kind of trying to slow down water in the landscape. And it's not at all obvious that it's a farmer's 